subjects. I can't get into one subject without covering a lot of areas. Before I start the message this morning, I want to give you a little bit of information. I'm here to teach you, not to look important, to be some important preacher. I want you to learn what the Bible says and what's correct text and what correct information is. That's why I've got these books here. I've got a library at home with several thousand books in my library. And I, I teach what is right and I teach what is wrong. I do not believe in the current translations of the Bible. Living Bible, that is good for putting in your fireplace and starting a fire with. That's about all it's good for. I do not believe in the NIV. NIV. I do not believe in the Revised Standard Version. I do not believe in the New England Bible. In anything that comes out of the Westcott and Hort text. Westcott and Hort. Mr. Westcott and Mr. Hort were supposedly scholars back in the 1800s. They concocted the the NIV, not the NIV, but the what they call the Westcott and Hort text. They took part of it out of the Vatican, out of the Vatican, and part of it out of Saint Catherine's Cathedral. Saint Catherine's Cathedral is in Alexander, Egypt. Alexander, Egypt. Catherine's Cathedral. And what was, why did they have an Alexandrian text? It, huh? <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I'm thinking ahead of myself. St. Catherine's Cathedral. I'll just put a C there. I don't believe in the West Cotton Hort text. You have the Textus Receptus, and it goes right along with the majority text. Majority, you have the Textus Receptus. I'm not going to give you a lot of this. I can talk for an hour on this. I'm just going to give you some basic things. Why we don't believe in the Westcott and Hort text. Mr. Westcott and Mr. Hort are trying to tell us that in 1881, when they came up with these, they call it the Codex Aleph and the Codex Baeth. Aleph and Baeth. Baeth. And the, or the A and the B, and it's called West Cotton Hort. They concocted these in 18. 81. What they're trying to tell us, we did not have the correct text from the, from the 4th century that the correct text of the Bible lay in the Vatican. And well, here's what's amazing. The Roman Catholic Bible does not come from Westcott and Hort. It comes from the Textus Receptus. That's amazing to me. But they simply changed the Roman Catholic changed the part of the Ten Commandments, uh, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, because they didn't want that. They have graven images all over the Catholic Church. But theirs comes from the text, from the Textus Receptus. There are 6,500 words that are not in the Westcott and Hort or the Aleph and Baeth that's in the uh, Textus Receptus. Now, it takes a lot of study, and you can spend your lifetime studying this and not get a real clear view of it. I've got some books that you can get. Uh, there is a, there is a uh, set of books. It's a two-volume set written by Dean John Burgeon. Dean John Burgeon. He was a dean of a seminary in the 1800s. And he, he was called the champion of lost causes because he defended 
the Textus Receptus, and he brings you some of the most outrageous things that Mr. Westcott and Mr. Hort uh, did. The NIV, when it, it didn't come out till 1966, I was 27 years old when the, when the NIV, the New International Version, came out. If you're sitting in a church or watching some preacher and he's reading along out of an NIV and you've got a King James Bible, all of a sudden he just loses you. Have you ever been in a church and seen that? Going, where in the world did he go? Well, that's because he's got a false text. He's in an NIV. And I don't believe in the NIV. I don't, the NIV, it does away with the deity of Christ. And the RSV, the Revised Standard Version, all comes from the West Cotton Horde. Even the American Standard comes from the West Cotton Horde. Don't believe in any of that. Can you get some of the truth out of the West Cotton? Yes, you can get some of the truth, but it'll say some things that's outrageous. The worst thing, over in Psalms, the 12th chapter, David said, God's word will be here in every generation. Well, they're saying that it was hidden in the Vatican and in St. Catherine's Cathedral from the 4th century till 1981. They're saying we did not have the true Word of God until 1881. That's outrageous. These two guys had some crazy belief. They believed in Mariolatry. Mariolatry is the worship of Mary along with Jesus. They go along with the Roman Catholics on a lot of that. And the NIV was at one time was the people who held the uh, uh, that held the documentation that published it was the same people in 1966 that distributed Playboy magazine. Now something's wrong with that. The worst thing about the Westcott and Hort text. This is the worst thing about it. It is an eclectic. text. Say, so I don't know what that means. Well, let me tell you what it means. It means that they had to pick out, they might have a text of one page, another text, they had like 5,000 extant. If you see the word extant, that means known texts. They had, you say, what does that mean? the Aleph and Beth Codex. The Codex means a manuscript, not an original manuscript. It means a copy. Let me put that up here. Since they did not have copy machines, they had men sitting around transcribing these copies, and they had all kinds of... Some men didn't like what they were looking at, so they would change the text. In, in the Textus Receptus, 995 out of every thousand agree with each other. In the Westcott and Hort, in the original text, five out of a thousand agree with each other. They would have all these different texts or codices. We would say codex or codis or codices. They would have all these texts and they were saying that they could pick out which, if you had John 8, where the woman is taken in adultery in one text, in John 8 in another text, they were saying they had to evaluate which was the best chapter and text to go to and put it into their Bible. You understand what I'm saying? Well, let me read something to you. Here's a great, great book written by Dr. Wilbur Pickering. It is the identity of the New Testament text. Let me read you some stuff that he says. He says, uh, gosh, I can't read all of this. I just want to read a little of it. 
the man the statements to be found in the prefaces of some versions of the Bible give the reader the impression that this improvement of the NIV is reflected in their translations. For example, the preface to the Revised Standard Version says, this is out of the wrong text. The King James Version of the New Testament was based upon Greek text that was marred by mistakes containing the accumulated errors of 14 centuries of manuscript copying. Not true, he puts in italics, not true, almost all TR readings are ancient. TR, Texas Receptus. And he goes on to say, I'm not going to stay in this because I want to get back to the message. He says, eclecticism, what is it? Wherein does eclecticism consist? Metzger explains that eclectic editor follows now one and now another of set of witnesses. In other words, you had any number of men working on this, and they were picking out which chapter, which verses belong in the Bible. I like what he says on this. E. C. Caldwell spells it out. The textual criticism turns for its final validation and the appraisal of individual readings in a way involves subjective judgment. Subjective is an opinion of a bunch of people. Objective is the facts. The trend has been to emphasize fewer and fewer canons of criticism. Many moderns emphasize only two, that reading is to be preferred which best suits the context. That reading is to be preferred which best explains the origin of all others. These two rules are nothing less than concentrated formulas of all that the textual critic must know and bring to bear upon the solution of his problem. The first rule about choosing what suits the context exhorts the student to know the document he is working on so thoroughly that its idioms are his idioms. You've got to be an expert to be able to pick out the text. Its ideas as well known as a familiar room. The second rule about choosing what will be the correct text, or eclecticism, what could have caused the other readings requires that a student know everything in Christian history, you get that? To be an eclectic text and pick it out, which could lead to the creation of a variant, variation of readings this involves knowledge of institutions, doctrines, and events. This is the knowledge of complicated and often conflicting forces and movements. What living person really possesses these qualifications? Nobody! And how can such rules be applied when neither the identity nor circumstances of the originator of a given variant is known. You're going to have to know everything about everything, every copyist, every man, his beliefs, when he's going to say, we'll pick this chapter instead of this chapter out of, we'll pick this, this manuscript out of this one. You'd have to be God himself to be able to do that. Love Mr. Pickering. Great writer. Now I'm going to get back to the message. Just thought I'd give you a little bit about these texts. I do not like one of the worst things about the NIV is John 3.16. John 3.16 in the NIV, I keep one up here so you can read it. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. It doesn't say that. It says He gave His monogenes, His only begotten Son. Only would be mono. Monogenes, genes comes from genesis or genesis or nativity. And he didn't give his only son. He gave his only begotten son. The only one he took out of himself. Over in 1 John 3 and 1, the Bible says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we'll be like him, for we will see him as he is. And he tells Moses, you go tell Pharaoh, 
Let my son go, for Israel is my son, even my firstborn. God did not give his only one and only son. He gave his only begotten son, the one he took out of himself. So that's my gripe about the Westcott and Hort text. That's just a little bit of my complaint. I've done a Westcott and Hort versus the text that's receptive series. Now, if you wonder why some preacher loses you while you're reading your King James Bible, people say, what Bible do I need? You need a King James Bible. Why? Why not the new King James? Why not? All of your words, most of your word studies are listed in a concordance or any other number of books according to the King James or Textus Receptus Scripture. That's what it's listed to. Nothing wrong with the New King James other than the fact they changed some words that you cannot look up in a concordance. And you don't want that. I would rather go back to the words. Now, let's get back to the message. All right. We've been talking about Saul. I hope that's a little bit of a lesson that'll challenge you to look into this. I use the King James Bible because I believe it comes from the correct text. People say, what do you use? I use the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. has a lot of helps in it. This is what all of the scholars used in the early 1900s, a lot of the guys from the seminaries. And uh, I, like the, I like it. I'm very familiar with it. Now, we're talking about Saul. How Saul was chasing David all over the country trying to kill him. He was angry to say the least. He was infuriated with David. Saul was a good man when he first started. The Bible says there wasn't a goodlier man in all of Israel. But God, somebody called me yesterday, said, you said that an evil spirit from God entered Saul. I didn't say that. The Bible says that in the 16th chapter of 1 Samuel. You can look at that real quick. 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter, 16 and verse 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord Trouble Saul. It came from God, and you've got an evil spirit several times here is troubling or coming and coming upon Saul. Now, what was wrong with Saul was something that we call the orge. Remember the G, G, and Ada. Anytime you see a word that ends with Ada or Ada, it knew. Or the eight is on the end of the word. It is always feminine gender. And I've had some of the the so-called Greek scholars, and they are Greek scholars, they just don't know enough about the Bible. You can study Greek and spew out Greek all day long, but if you don't know the Scripture with it, you don't know the truth. Mr. Mount says that the orge can be God's, God's wrath also. I deny that. I do not believe a lot of the guys want to face the truth about where the wrath of man comes from. Man's wrath comes from God. Orge is the anger and the rage that a man has when he's uh, jealous envious and he doesn't like it because somebody has stolen something from him maybe you don't like it because somebody's stealing the attention or they come into a room and they're a little obnoxious a little know-it-all and you think that's terrible and you want to put them down for that maybe they haven't developed to be where you are yet we're not to have the orge about anybody stealing what it's attention whether it's money or things or whether they get a promotion before us, if you ever become like Christ, you'll have to put down all that jealousy 
and all that envy and understand and be compassionate towards the believers that are struggling and they haven't arrived to where you are yet. And if you think you've arrived, you're not where you think you are. It's really peculiar how that I was a real humble little boy. I would just walk around being, kept my mouth shut all the time. And I was this humble kid. And then when I grew up, I learned to be proud of everything I could do. And then God put me through all this, this fire and trials. He made me an old man and turned me back into a little boy once more. I don't try to get attention. I don't try to go out here. When, when we're over at the house making up the DVDs, I don't sit there and try to get attention. People may be asking me questions, and I'll be answering the questions, but I'm not trying to get attention. I'm not trying to be the leader every time I walk in the door. I don't believe in that. I believe what we have to do is humble ourselves under the hand of God, and the hand of God is evil men, and they'll press us down and oppress us till we come to that place. So if, you, if you're still at this place of pride, you've got to be humbled and turn back to a little boy and a little girl once again. How many old people have you seen? How many old believers have you seen that are lifted up in pride? Not many. When you get old, you just back off and people say, but you haven't gone through what we've gone through. We've all gone what you've gone through. We've been proud and lifted up as young men. But when you get old, you don't want to be that. And you don't want the attention anymore. That's what's wrong with the world is the orge. But the orge is the nature of man. Let me read something to you about the orge. Orge is man's nature. Look over here in, look over here in uh, Ephesians, the second chapter. One more time. Ephesians, the second chapter, and look here in, I believe it's the third verse. Third verse, speaking of us being children of disobedience from the second verse, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and of the mind, and were, we used to be, by nature, the children of wrath, even as others. That word wrath is or gay. It's feminine gender. Why does that have to be man's wrath? Because the Bible says in Revelation 17 and 5 that Babylon was the mother of, the mother of all idolatry. Idolatry is the word pornea, P-O-R-N-E-I-A. Or porne, various spellings of it, P-O-R-N-E. We get our word porn from that, but porn doesn't mean just to look at naked men and women. Porn means idolatry. She's the mother of harlots, it says, and that word harlot is porne. So if, if Babylon, mother, gave birth to, nurtured, all idolatry, idolatry, E-I-D-O-L-O-L-A-T-R-E-I-A is the word idolatry. It comes from ido, meaning to see, and latro, meaning to serve. It means to serve what you see and what it, you put into your eyes and your ears. It means to have an excessive desire to fulfill the flesh. That's also the word covetous. So, the orge is our nature. That's what it says, doesn't it? In Ephesians 2 and 3. Why is it our nature and what is what was Babylon mothered upon? Where was she organized? Genesis 11. 4. They said they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they said, here's what we want. Let us build us a city and a tower 
whose top may reach into heaven. And here's our doctrine. Let us make us. This is all about us. A name. Name is the word Shem in the Hebrew. It is the word Onoma in the Greek. They have the same meaning. It means let us make our own authority. We will come up with our own doctrine. Pride is the doctrine of self. It's I. I love the verse over in Isaiah 47. It's the most powerful verse about Babylon. I've got to read it one more time. I'll read this every time I get a chance. This is it. This is everything that Babylon's about. Isaiah 47, verse 8. Therefore hear now this, thou art given to pleasures that dwellest carelessly, that saith in thine heart, I am, and nobody matters but me. That's it. In everything we do, I shall not be a widow, neither shall I suffer the loss of children. But these two things shall come in a moment when you think you're on your way to the top. In one day, the loss of children and widowhood, they shall come upon thee in their perfection for the multitude of thy sorceries and for the great abundance of thine enchantment. For thou hast trusted in thy wickedness. Wickedness is not just robbing banks and rape and murder. Wickedness is self. Thou hast said, none seeth me. God don't know what I'm doing. You ever, ever been doing something you thought, I'm too small in this great scheme of things for God to know what's going on? Thy wisdom and thy knowledge, it hath perverted you. And thou hast said in thine heart, I am and none else beside me, and I'm the only one that matters in this business situation, on my job, in my family, whether I get the car, whether I get this or not, whether I get that diamond ring, whether I get what I want. And that's all that matters. You ever felt that way? Oh, you don't say it that way. You just say, I've got to have that car. I've got to have that woman. I've got to have that house. I've got to get the promotion at work. If that guy gets it, I'll be so angry at him, and I'll get him for that. You ever been like that? Yep, we all have, haven't we? There's no temptation taken one man, but it's common to all men. Now, I know what's in your heart. God's made me made me admit and own up and confess what's in my heart. He nearly killed me at one point in life. I mean, I was in a hospital stay that was devastating. And I have had to learn I've got to deal with me above everybody else. Now, I want to give you, where does that old gate come from? Well, it comes from God creating us from the corrupt dust of the ground. That's our nature. That's what you're going to fight the rest of your life is trying to get even with people. Trying to get even is, I've got a section of a set of books. It's O-R-G-E. It's out of Kittle's New Testament Greek words. And it'll tell you what it's about, what Orge is about. One of the simple short definitions is against other men against God and it is the wrath that's upon man that comes from God in your very nature and you say I don't ever feel angry at people have you had the least bit of resentment of somebody getting something and you have a hard time admitting it to yourself that you believe you deserved it and they didn't you ever had that what you've got is what you're supposed to have and you're not supposed to have any more than what you have God made every one of us that way. Or gay. It's the impulsive nature in man or the beast in man, the impulsive state of the human disposition. I like that. Not blind anger, but he uses a word I don't believe in. He says demonic excess of will. It's just the excess of the will 
in the nature of the tragic person goes hand in hand with an anke that's pressuring people and necessity and faith. Let me read something else here to you. It is revenge and punishment. I'll get them somehow. I'll get what I deserve here. And he goes on to say, or gay, which is already in tragedy, is always seen to be protecting something recognized to be right. It's only right that I have my way. Or gay itself acquired the meaning of punishment. You're going to punish people. God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, thus saith the Lord. Remember the word vengeance. I've given it to you a dozen times. Remember it? Does anybody remember vengeance? Nobody? Huh? No. Ek decay. Ek decayo or ek decasis. It means decay, right, ek, out. I'm going to write out, I'm going to make things right, and you're not. You can't make somebody behave. Have you found that out yet? You can't change their heart, can you? Egdikasis is the word revenge or vengeance. It belongs to me, God says. If anything's to be made right, I will do the making right. If you get involved, I'll stop you. When you start trying to fix things and make it right. Orge acquired the meaning of punishment. Orge, which is already in tragedy, has always been protecting something recognized to be right. You're going to protect yourself. Anger is natural and even necessary for great acts and virtues. For military valor, that's all well and good. But have anger for yourself. And this anger is accompanied by many other things. And it was called the Furies in the ancient world. The Furies is going to be vengeance, revenge, getting angry, getting back at people. We're only to be angry at one thing, and that's preachers who are preaching a doctrine that eats like a canker. It's false doctrine. That's the only thing that we're to be angry at. We're to be angry at those people and those winds of doctrine that make the church apathetic. That's why I'm angry at these preachers in America. They're not telling the truth. They're talking about a daily cross, self-denial, death to self, and so forth. And the orge was called the wrath of the gods in the ancient world. Little G-O-D-S. That was the, the furies was the wrath of the pagan gods. Well, the pagan gods are just self. Zeus in his angers against Prometheus causes the punishment to follow the fault immediately. And this goes on and on. I don't have to read all that. Where, let me show you where the Bible says this or gay comes from God. Go to Romans, the first chapter. And this is what was wrong with Saul. He said David had stolen his throne. God, he should have known better than that. He trusted Samuel. Samuel is the one that ordained Saul to be king. He's, well, God ordained him. Samuel anointed him king by anointing him with oil. But that was the will of God. God told Samuel, You go into southern Judah. I've chosen me a king among his sons. And that would eventually be David, the true king, out of the tribe of Judah. Now, where did I say we were going? Oh, Romans. Romans 1. This is why you need to look up words because this sounds like something that it's not. When you look up the words, it's totally different in the Greek text. All right. Romans, the first chapter. Verse, this is one of David's favorite verses. Verse, one, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. It says against all unrighteousness. The word is not against. The word is epi. That is the word that's been translated against. Epi. 
Epi is one of the words that has been translated in in the New Testament. Epi means to cover with. That's the same prefix over there in Acts 2.38 when Peter says, they say, Peter tells them to repent, and that Peter's preaching to them about the resurrection, preaching to all these people at Pentecost, and they say, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter says, Repent, every one of you, in the name of Christ. That word, he said, in, Be baptized in, Be baptized for the remission of sins. It actually says, be baptized in or epi, superimposing the name of Christ upon you. Name is the word onoma. Onoma means authority. Superimposing the authority of Christ. I don't have time to go into it, but there's no way he's telling 3,000 men at Pentecost to go be dipped in water. The nearest water was about 15 miles away at the Jordan River. And those Pharisees were not going to turn over their public works to dip 3,000 people in water. They're not going to do that because they just got through killing Jesus 50 days before this Pentecost. And they hated him. Why are they going to turn over their water works to dip? He's not talking about dipping people. He's talking about superimposing are covering with the name of Christ. And God's name is His authority, and that's His Word. Now, I don't mean to get into baptism this morning. To cover all over, that's what epi means. So epi means to cover with. So, so for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, covering all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. God covers men with the orge. You can't say, well, if I've got the orge and God wants me to have it, He created His people in physical bodies. The fact you have skin on you and you're in a physical body means you've got this desire for revenge in you. Everybody has it. I don't care how quiet you are. I don't care how backward you are. I don't care how sophisticated you are, how much you think you have it together. You've got the orge in you, don't we? Do you have it? I, do. I know you do. <laughs> we all have that. If you don't even want to recognize it, it's going to be a long time before you get over it. And unrighteous of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now let me give you another verse that shows you this comes from God. Go over here to... Go over here to uh, Romans 5. All right. Look here in Romans 5. We're going to start in verse 8. But God commendeth his love, his agape, toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, you're a sinner and you had been born again, and he is commending his love toward you, his agape, Christ died for us, the believers, the elect, much more than being now justified by His blood. Justified doesn't mean saved. Justified, D-K-I-O, D-I-K-A-I-O-O. It means to render innocent, to pronounce us innocent, to render innocent. That's what he's doing. We shall be saved, sozo. Now, here's what we're saved from. When you're a believer, when you're a believer in Christ, here's what you're saved from. We're saved from or gay through him. It says, we're saved from taste. Taste or gaze. We're saved from the rage and revenge. 
Well, you're, what's saved is the inner man. And he says, now, we're going to start working on the outer man, and I'm going to put you through all kinds of trials and problems until you learn to behave yourself and get over getting angry at everything that comes along. We don't even have any right to be angry at the world, ever. Well, that's a hard thing to deal with, isn't it? Why do we not have any right to be angry at the world? Because God has made all the people in the world what they are. You're either a vessel of wrath or you're a vessel of mercy, which God hath before prepared to glory. If you're a vessel of mercy, when you look at the world and they're hurting you and hurting a lot of other people, why is it you're not supposed to be angry at them? Because God made them that way. He made them vessels of wrath and fitted them to destruction. He made them natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. If God made somebody, Organia is the word in Second Peter. In Second Peter 2 and 12, He made them natural brute beasts. They were born to be full of orge and never get over it. Well, who made them that way? God made them that way. What right do we have? What we do is engage ourselves in their their type of living when we say, I have a right to get angry at them. I've had people come here and do me wrong and lie about me and tell stories about me, and I don't get angry anymore. I'm talking about the last four or five times this has happened. I don't get angry. What do you get? Well, I get sad and grieved. And that's okay, because Jesus is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Expect to be lied about when you live righteously and godly. It's just going to happen. So he says we're saved from wrath through Christ. All of this was put here by God. God is the one, and even whenever the Bible looks like, it looks like it's saying something it's not saying. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Go over here to, go to Mark, the third chapter. I'm not going to stay on all gay. I'm going to come back and give you something all gay every week. I'm going to get back to Saul because he was full of the all gay. He said, the throne belongs to me. And Samuel said, not anymore, it doesn't. You have not, you have not done the will of God at Amalek. You had, did not do the will of God in the 13th, 14th, 15th chapters of 1 Samuel. So Samuel tells Saul, God's taken the kingdom from you and going to give it to your neighbor down in southern Judah from Bethlehem, Judah, and have him going down there to pick out a king among the sons of Jesse. And when he went down there, he, God had picked, God picked out... Not Samuel. God picked out David because the first person that Samuel, that Saul, excuse me, that Samuel looked at when he got down there was the oldest son of Jesse. Jesse and Saul, Samuel, excuse me. Jesse and Samuel believed that Eliab, surely this is the Lord's anointed because he's tall, he's strong, and he's a great soldier in Saul's army. God said, I haven't chosen this. God called, Abinad, uh, called Eliab this. I haven't chosen this tall guy. I don't want him. Do you have any more sons? He said, yes, there remains the youngest, and he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said, I'll not leave till you bring him in. And they brought in David. God says, this is him. So God picked out David to be king of Israel. The word got through all of Israel, and everybody knew about it. And Saul thinks that this was David's idea, or I believe he really knew it wasn't David's idea because everybody knew that David had been anointed by Samuel. And Saul trusts Samuel. That's what gets me. He trusts him. Saul was a typical, was typical rebellious man full of orge that was a believer. He was, God's program, he was in God's program. That's right. And an evil spirit from God entered Saul. That shows that several times. It was an evil spirit from God that came into him. I'm going to show you a couple more times here. Look over here in Mark. 
Now this looks like it's saying something it doesn't say. In chapter 3, And Jesus entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus, whether he would heal him, on the Sabbath day. They said, you can't do any healing on the Sabbath. That they might accuse him. These are the Pharisees going to accuse Jesus. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil, and to save life, or to kill? And they held their peace. They were already infuriated. Why were they infuriated? Well, he's going to heal on the Sabbath, and he just got through healing a man in the previous chapter. Well, let me read the next thing it says. When he had looked around on them with anger. It looks like Jesus is anger, angry. You cannot be grieved and angry at the same time. There are two different methods of emotions. He looked around on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. Jesus wasn't angry. The, the men were angry at him because in the previous chapter, he had told the man that was born of four, brought to him through the tiles of a roof, he said, Thy sins be forgiven thee. And they said, You can't forgive sins. Only God can do that. They're already infuriated at him. He's talking to the same Pharisees and Sadducees here. They said, You can't forgive sins. So they're already infuriated at him. That word anger is the word orge. It's not, he looks around on those people. They had the anger, and he was grieved at their anger for wanting to heal a man here on the Sabbath day. Look at the man before that in the second chapter. Second chapter, there's a man born of four there in verse 3, and he is a man that is... Uh, well, let me read up from the first verse. Again, he entered into Capernaum. Capernaum is on the very north end of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus moved his city where he operated from. He moved from Nazareth, which was up here in the land of Zebulun, over to the very top of the Sea of Galilee. That's where Capernaum was, right up here. So he's put his headquarters up there on the top of the Sea of Galilee. That's where Capernaum is. And after some days it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together in so much as there is no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. So he's in this house and it's very crowded. And they came unto him bringing one sick of the palsy which was born of four. Four men are carrying this man sick of the palsy. And when... They could not come nigh to him for the press. The pressure was too great. They were wanting to bring this man in so Jesus can heal him. So they have faith that he can heal him as well as the man, right? They uncovered the roof. Well, they didn't have roofs like we do. They didn't have these roofs with a pitch on them. They had flat roofs so they could put there. Here's a door. And they had a staircase going up the side. So they could put their, they could lay out their uh, corn and their figs and dry them here on the top of the house. And they had all these tiles on the roof. So they went up there on the roof and they pulled some tiles off, took the man down through the roof of the building. And when they could not come to nigh for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw the faith of all five of them, the four men carried him, and the man laying there with the palsy, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee, and these scribes go crazy. What are you talking about? 
But there were certain of the scribes sitting there, reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemy? There's already anger at him here. Who can forgive sins but God only? So by the time you get to the next chapter, they're still infuriated because he has forgiven sins, proving himself to be God. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto the scribes, they, he says, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee. Arise and take up thy bed and walk. But that you scribes may know. He didn't heal the man because of his faith. He forgave his sins because of his faith. Now when Kenneth Copeland quotes this, he says, The man received his healing. He didn't receive nothing. Jesus looks at the scribes. Here's the man sitting over here. He looks at the scribes. He said that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Watch this. Mystery. Rise up and walk. He didn't heal the man because of his faith. He healed him to prove who he was to the scribes. That's all. You can't come up and say, he received his healing. He did not. So, the scribes are infuriated at him. When you get to chapter 2, and Jesus is going to heal another man on the Sabbath, these people are just enraged at him, and they're the ones with the anger. They're the ones with the orge. And they want to kill him for that. Now, let me give you a couple more of these. Look over here in Romans 4. Romans 4. Then I'll get back to Paul. I'll get back to Saul. Excuse me. Get their names mixed up. Romans 4. All right. Romans 4. Now, let's read here in verse 14 and 15. Romans 4. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, but the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh or gay. The fact that there is a law and that says thou shalt not, that works the orgay of man. Man says, you're stealing from me. I'm going to get you for that. You're taking my position. You're taking the, you're having the conversation go your way when you walk into the room. You're more popular than I am. You're more glib than I am. You got more to say than I've got to say. Well, then study, son, if you don't like that. So he says, the law worketh or gay for where no law is there's no transgression now look over here in james the first chapter james the or gay comes from god it's upon man by his nature and it's something everybody here has to deal with and if you don't deal with it you'll be like saul you may have to end up dying for your sin one day but if you belong to god you're going to deal with the or gay with this vengeance that you have in your heart. Every one of us have it. Nobody's exempt from that. It's put upon man by his nature, isn't it? And maybe you don't like that. I didn't say that. The Bible says that. Look here in James. All right. James, the first chapter. Look at verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to orge. Be real slow to get angry with somebody. You say, well, if they'll straighten up, I won't be angry at them. No, 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 no. You're not supposed to be angry at them when they don't straighten up because God made them that way. You don't wait till somebody gets their life together to care about them. Boy, that's a 
difficult statement. For the wrath of man, the orge of man, worketh not the righteousness of God, does not work what's right. Righteousness, dikaiosune, D-I-K-A-I-O-S-U-N-E. What is right is of God. It comes from DK, meaning right. The orge and the dikaiosune are complete opposites in God's universe. You cannot have the orge and be doing what's right. Do we have it? Yes. Do you have to deal with it over time? Yes. That's what the fire and the trials and the persecution is about, is to get over ourselves. Didn't the Bible say over there in Romans, the third chapter, that we're saved from the orge through Jesus Christ? It's not you're saved all of a sudden. Over a long period of time, you'll get over the orge. You'll get old and you say, i got to stop doing this. Has anybody besides old people ever come to that conclusion? that you have to stop doing things you're doing. And do you still have a heart? The younger you are, when you come to the realization you've got to stop doing things, the harder it is to overcome it, isn't it? Now, I've got a whole list of these orge uh, references, but we're saved from the orge. The orge, that's a lifetime work of God in our lives. God's got to put you through fire and trials and persecution, have people want to put you down and stop you. You have to come. It's like I said when I said earlier, you get real high with your opinion of yourself, and you be, have to be brought low. The Bible says that we have to be brought down low. The man that exalts himself will be abased, and the man that abases himself will be exalted. So this is of God. Now, let's get back over. So this is what's wrong with Paul. He thinks, uh, excuse me, this is what's wrong with Saul. I'll get it in a minute. This is what's wrong with Saul. He thinks it was David's idea to take over his kingdom. I don't really believe he believed that. I believe it was God's idea. But what he wants to do is fight against God, doesn't he? Now let's go back to 1 Samuel. I went through chapter 24. David is the king in Israel in the eyes of God as of the 16th chapter when God tells Saul, uh, he tells Samuel, you, ordain, you, you anoint this young shepherd boy, he's my king. And then Saul gets, hold, gets wind of it. And the particular thing that really gets to Saul, after David kills Goliath, we've gone through it, David comes into town, in Saul's court, comes into, into where Saul is abiding at this time, and the women start singing, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul is just outraged with orge. That's my kingdom. You can't take my kingdom from me. That's my kingdom on the job. You can't take that from me. And you've worked for years, and they pick somebody up that the boss gets along with and promote him, and you've been there 10, younger, ten years longer than he has, and you think you deserve it. The only way that you're going to get that kind of position is if you're buddy-buddy and palsy-wowsy with the boss, and you don't have any principle about it, you don't have no conviction. That's the only way to work. But you already, the vessel of mercy which God hath therefore prepared to glory. So you can't be, you can't be what you want to be to get along with the world. So you can rise up the ranks of, a position. It's not going to happen. Except what you are, we are what we are, and we can't get over it, can we? I couldn't get over little Jimmy Brown. I was just a little squirt, growing up. I was just skinny. I never was popular. I couldn't speak in front of a class. I remember one time I was doing a report in American history class, and I had some cards in front of me, and I was just trembling and shaking. I couldn't hardly. I remember it was about Sir Francis and Drake and Trafalgar, and that's about all I can remember about the armada of the Spanish fighting the French. And I, and I was up there just trembling and shaking. You'd think that 
a man that is standing in front of a crowd at nearly 80 years old could speak when he was young. I couldn't. I just was, I was just backward and pulled away from everybody. And I know you don't believe that, but that's the truth. You don't know who God, in fact, you don't know who God can put in a position to be your boss somewhere in the future. Don't watch out how you treat people. It might, that guy that's uh, sacking groceries might be the manager of your company before it's over with. Now, back here to where we were. We've already talked about there's twice, twice, where David gets Saul trapped. Saul is chasing David all over the country from the from 1 Samuel, the 19th chapter, all the way through the 31st chapter. He's trying to kill David. God sees to it that David has a chance to kill Saul. But David won't do it. He says, that's the Lord's anointed. We don't touch the Lord's anointed. And he says that in the 24th chapter. Then chapter 25 and verse 1. This is important because the Bible says Samuel died. Now, stop and think. It doesn't take a, anybody brilliant to figure this out. Could Samuel have written first and second Samuel? <laughs> No, because he's dead in the first verse of the 25th chapter of 1 Samuel. We don't know exactly who wrote these books. Samuel could have written the book up to this point, but he can't written past his death, could he? No. So, Samuel died, and all of Israel were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his house at Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Now, the fact that Samuel dies here, I brought this out to you. The fact that he dies in 25 and 1 means if he appears to Saul at the very end of this book, two years after this, it's two years later, then it is, we know that what Samuel says to Saul over here in right at the end of the book in the uh, 27th chapter excuse me in the 29th chapter that's where Saul goes to the witch of Endor and says bring up Samuel for me from the dead well the witch of Endor can't do that because she's just a witch which is phony the word witch is the word costs off. When the Bible says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, a witch was not an old hag with a hooked nose with warts all over her face riding across the sky going, ah, ha, 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 ha. That's not a witch. Costs off is the word witch. It means to whisper or talk smooth it's like good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple this is a concoction this old hag riding a broom that's not the truth a witch was a smooth talker hey Eve thou shalt not surely die you don't have to really repent of sin just walk down the aisle and accept Christ and you're home free you kind of live the way you want to live God wants you to have lots of money and, and things. Any preacher that talks like that and talks smooth, he's a witch. Billy Graham was a witch. Charles, Charles Stanley is a witch. Without a doubt, Kenneth Copeland is a witch. So is T.D. Jakes. They're witches. They're smooth talkers telling you how God wants you to have money and things. They're flatterers. The Bible says we are not to use flattering titles. We're not to flatter people. I don't flatter anybody. I will tell you the truth. If you don't want the straight answer, don't ask me. I've had people say, do you believe this? I say, absolutely not. Do you want to know why? 
I don't beat around the bush and try to make them feel better about their question. I don't do that. I say, no. Now, I'll tell you why if you want to know. Have you learned to use great plainness of speech yet? Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3 and 11, Seeing we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Great is the word polus. P-O-L-U-S. Polus means often. Don't just use plainness once. Use it often. Plainness is the word parhesia. P-A-R-R-H-E-S-I-A. It means to be blunt. It doesn't mean to be abrasive. A lot of you have asked me a question. I say, no. Don't believe that at all. I have people say, well, do you believe in water baptism? No, I do not. Would you like to hear me explain it? I will explain. Whenever I say something that blunt, I will be... It means to be blunt, to the point. It means do not circumvent. You say, I don't know what that word means. Let me give it to you. Circumvent means to beat, circum, get the word circle from that. Don't beat around the bush. Get to the point. Don't sit there and talk, oh, let me see, how can I make these people feel better? If they're elect, they'll hear blunt, plain speech. If they're not elect, then I go, then I go like anything you're going to say. So go ahead and get to the point. Don't say, I've got to talk smooth to make, keep these people from being angry at me. Now, we're there in the 24th chapter where that they trapped Saul inside of a cave. Saul is chasing David. Right before that, in the very end of chapter 23, Saul has trapped David, and he can't get away. He surrounded him. He's compassed him about. And God sends the Philistines to Jerusalem to attack him so a messenger can come to Saul and say, Saul, 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 the Philistines are attacking Jerusalem. He says, well, I don't know which way to go. I have to go back. And take care of the Philistines, and David gets away. And then we see that Saul comes back to chasing David. Isn't this amazing? How many times does Saul say, I'm not going to kill David? <laughs> does that mean anything? It doesn't mean a thing. Because he keeps pursuing David, and he says, when, Well, I don't need to go into all the times he said it, but he says to Jonathan, I'm not going to kill your friend David. And the very next day, he's out after him. Now, go over here. I'm not going to go into the 25th chapter. That's all about Nabal. And uh, I'm going to go over here to the 26th chapter. We'll get back to Nabal and Abigail, his wife. David takes Abigail from Nabal. Nabal is a very wicked man. David says, I'm the king of Israel and I need some food. And Nabal says, I'm not giving you food, not giving you anything. And, and then Nabal is killed, and David takes Abigail, his wife, to be his wife. So that gives David a wife named Abigail and a sister named Abigail. So you're going to have to keep this straight, okay? <laughs> You'll find his sister named Abigail over there in the second chapter of 1 Chronicles. Abigail, his sister... Abigail, his sister, has a son named Amasa. And Amasa, David's going to try to replace Zeruiah, Z-E-R-U-I-A-H. She's got three sons, Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. Now, Asahel is not going to be a problem because Asahel is killed when he's chasing Abner. In a, they're having a, they're having a, in 2 Samuel, they're having some war games. And, and Abner's, Abner has taken the place of Saul. 
the king because Saul has been killed at the very end of 1 Samuel. So only one man is there that can lead the troops, and that's Abner. Abner's a good man. Abner comes from Ab and Ner. Ab is father, and Abner's father was a man named Ner. Ner. So Abner means the son of Ner. Well, Abishai and Joab, they're the surviving sons of Zeruiah. Joab is a killer. You don't want to have mess you don't want to cross him at all. That's David's nephew. Joab is the one that got to be commanding general of David's armies. The way that happened, well, let me show you how it happened. I'm kind of skipping around, but flip over here to first Chronicles. Because you're not going to know how this happened. I just like to reveal this. And along the way, I'll mention it again. First Chronicles, I believe it's the tenth chapter. First Chronicles ten. Verse 4, I'm just going to show you David's nephew, how he became David's commander-in-chief. He became the four-star general of David's army. Verse 4, David, this is in chapter, excuse me, chapter 11. Chapter 11 of First Chronicles. And David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jebus. This is not hard to remember because that's where the Jebusites lived, Jebus. And one of the tribes of all of the evil men was the Jebusites. Now if, gosh, this takes me so many things. If Joshua, when he came into Israel, if he'd done what God said and drove out all the Hittites, the Jebusites, there would have been no Jebusites in this chapter. But they didn't. They intermarried with them. Lordy mercy. So, David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jebus, where the Jebusites were, the inhabitants of the land. And the inhabitants of Jebus said to David, Thou shalt not come hither. You can't come here where we are. Well, that's a wrong thing to say to David with all of his army. Nevertheless, David took the castle of Zion, which is where Jerusalem sits, and that's where the Jebusites were, which is the city of David. So they take Jebus, change the name to Jerusalem. And David said, Whosoever smiteth the Jebusites first shall be chief and captain. So Joab, the son of David's sister Je Zeruiah, went up first, and he was chief. He became the commander of David's armies. And he was bad news for anybody that bucked up against him. You'll see movies about David. It's always got Joab standing over there. Yes, sir, David, yes. And all he's doing is being polite. He wasn't polite at all. He was a bad, bad man to mess with. And David dwelt in the castle, therefore they called it the city of David, and it became Jerusalem. Now, go back over here. So, now, Joab was the commander, and he was a killer. He killed, he's the one that David sent the message, said, after he got Bathsheba pregnant, in the eleventh chapter of second of first Kings, he sent her husband Uriah the Hittite into battle and told Joab, "You withdraw from him, so he'll be killed." So Joab, David employed Joab, his nephew, to murder to, to murder Uriah the Hittite. And Joab, Joab and Abishai got together and murdered. Abner, which was a good, righteous man, uh, commander of northern Israel. And David, at one point, David, Joab was just too much for him. He said, I can't handle him. In fact, when Absalom, David's son, 
had he had his army drive his father David out of Jerusalem he went north and went across the Jordan River and went to a city called Mahanaim and that was a city of refuge when they fight Absalom's armies uh, during that battle Absalom has all this long hair beautiful hair and he he rides a donkey up under a tree and his hair gets caught in the tree and he's hanging there. He's not dying. And Joab comes upon him. Joab says, this is my chance. And he throws a spear and runs Absalom through. Now the thing is, Joab had been told by David, and don't anybody, he had told Abishai, Abishai and Joab were with him when he fled Jerusalem. He said, don't anybody harm my son Absalom. Well, Joab runs a spear through him. Just like Joab didn't care what David said. I'll say it to you. The generals ran the army. They ran the nation. They ran the whole show. If you got a general behind you, you could take over. Joab didn't want to take over. He just didn't listen to David. And so David gets to where he cannot handle Abishai, Abishai is always running his mouth. Uncle David, I'll kill this dead dog. He's talking about Saul. David said, you don't touch the Lord's anointed. And finally, David is saying, are these sons of Zerai are too hard for me. God, what did you give me these nephews for? To rule your life. Because after the sin of David with Bathsheba God says the sword will never leave your house I'm going to bring the sword to your house to your two nephews Joab and Abishai I'm going to bring it to you through your son Absalom I'm going to have your son Amnon rape your daughter Tamar and then I'm going to have Absalom plot for two years at a festival to kill Amnon, murder his brother. Whew. The young and restless in Israel. <laughs> That's all I got to say. And through his whole life, and his son Adonijah, David's son Adonijah tried to take this kingdom from Saul or from Solomon in the first chapter of First Kings. How do you get to the king of Israel? Through his kids. How does he get to you? through your kids you don't want that do you and that can happen to all of us because of our or gay David tries to appoint Amasa his sister Abigail's son as commander of Israel instead of Joab you don't kick Joab out Joab walks up to him and says, Hey, brother, how you doing? Hold this! Stabs him under the fifth rib and kills his... So Joab is truly a... If there's a murderer, it was Joab. You don't fool with him. And then after he comes back, after he kills Absalom, the word goes back to David that Absalom is dead, and David starts weeping, saying, Absalom, my son, my son. And Joab says, Uncle David, why are you mourning over him? He's trying to take your kingdom away. Joab chewed out David like he was a red-headed stepchild. No offense. <laughs> he just chewed out David. He did, didn't care. Isn't that amazing? Now, back over here. Sometimes I'll give you, it's hard to give you all of these facts all at once. I'll remind you of some of these things as we go through these chapters. All that was wrong with Saul, he had Orgay coming out his ears. And he's going to kill David. Look here in chapter 26. David and Abishai. Abishai, his nephew, was with him everywhere he went. In fact, when he was coming back from that battle against Absalom, his son... They were, when he was fleeing from Absalom, before he crosses the river, 
a man named Shemai, H-E-M-A-I. He is a man, he's throwing rocks, throwing stones at David with Abishai. And the man is screaming. He is of the he was one of Saul's one of Saul's people. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin, and he's screaming at David, saying, You stole my master's throne. And David just drops his head. He knows he's committed all these sins. He knows what he's done. And Abishai says, Uncle David, I'll go kill this dead dog. He says, shut up, Abishai. God hath bidden him to throw stones at me. Let him throw stones. Do you ever say that when somebody starts throwing stones at you? And they're being completely unfair. God will get his revenge on Shammai before it's over with. Leave him alone. People that give you a hard time, just leave him alone, okay? Don't try to fix them. You can't. Why are they in the condition they're in? God made them that way. You want to go against the will of God and say, I want to get them back? Get them back what? For God t- picking them up and whipping you with it because they're nothing but a, a switch in God's hand? You want to say, I don't like it because you're whipping me with this evil man in my life, Lord. You ever done that? Every one of us have. That's our old gay. Now let's read here in chapter 26. They trapped Saul once again. And Abishai begins to run his mouth. Let's read. And the Ziphites came unto Saul to give you a saying. Doesn't David hide himself in the hill of Hakilah, which is before Jeshimon? Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel. Now remember, these are chosen warriors in Israel. David's only got at the most 600. Remember that? This will put us in mind of David numbering Israel at the end of 2 Samuel. And David's wanting to take credit because he's got a million eight hundred thousand men at the end of 2 Samuel to conquer all his enemies. And so he numbers them and says, I'm bragging on all of my great mighty men of valor. God says, that's not because you whipped Israel when Saul was chasing you. Chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul pitched in the hill of Hikalah, which is before Jeshimon, by the way. But David abode in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him in the wilderness. And Saul has promised he's not going to kill David, but boy, he's tried to do everything to do it, isn't he? David therefore sent out spies and understood that Saul was come. In very deed, he's really on the way. And David arose and came to the place where Saul had pitched. And David beheld the place where Saul lay. And Abner, the son of Ner, that's Saul's commanding general, the captain of host of his host, and Saul lay in a trench, and the people pitched round about him. They were laying on the ground around Saul. Then answered David and said to Ahimelech, the Hittite, and to Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, brother to Joab. He says, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul to the camp? Boy, Abishai is jumping at, he's just chomping at the bits. I'll go. And Abba said, I will go down with thee, Uncle David. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abner and the people lay round about him. Then said Abishai to David, God's delivered, God hath delivered thine enemy into thy hand this day. Now, therefore, I'll kill him, Uncle David. I pray thee with the spear even at the earth at once. I will not smite him a second time. I'll plunge it right to his heart. And David said to Abishai, No, no, Abishai. Gosh, you're always mouthing off. 
That's why he cried out in Second Samuel, These sons of Zerai are too hard for me. I can't handle Abishai, and I can't handle Joab. Joab is always wanting to murder somebody. Abishai, destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? God had him anointed by Samuel over there in that 12th chapter of 1 Samuel. And he was a goodly man when it started. David said, if God wants him dead, God will have to make him dead. We're not going to do that, nephew. Leave him alone. And David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, this is not, Kenneth Copeland will use these, don't stretch your hand against the Lord's anointed. That's me. You're not the Lord's anointed. You don't know anything about the truth. And a lot of these false teachers say, we're the Lord's anointed. No, you're not. You're anointed with truth there in 1 John 2 and 27. And you have no truth. Now, where was I? 10. David said, Furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die when God's ready. He shall descend into battle and perish. David is prophesying Saul's in in the 31st chapter. He's going to descend into battle against the Philistines, and he's going to die in battle. But we're not going to have anything to do with that. You got that, nephew? The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed, but I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is in his bolster and the cruise of water, and let's go. I'll have some proof to show him. And David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster, and they got them away, and nobody saw them, nor knew it, neither awakened. For they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord was falling upon them. This sleep came from God. Nobody's going to wake up. Then David went over to the other side. And watch what David does. He's going to reprimand and chew out Abner. That's supposed to be his bodyguard. That's supposed to be his top man. And stood on the top of a hill afar off in a great space between them. And David cried to the people, and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Abner, answerest thou not Abner? Then Abner answered and said, Who art thou that Christ to the king? And David said to Abner, Abner, you're his commander-in-chief. Why weren't you guarding him? David is looking out for Saul, and Saul is trying to persuade David to kill him. Will you look out for your enemy? when he's pursuing after you. And David said to Abner, Art thou a valiant man? Who is like to thee in Israel? Wherefore then hast thou not kept the Lord the king? Abner, it's your fault. He's going to put the blame where it belongs. You're supposed to be his bodyguard looking after him. You didn't. Thou not... Wherefore then hast thou not kept the Lord the king? For there came one of the people in to destroy the king thy Lord. This thing is not good that thou hast done. As the Lord liveth, ye are not, you are worthy to die. Abner, I'm not even talking to Saul. And Abner was a good man. That's amazing. I'm about out of time, ain't I? Because you have not kept the master, the Lord's anointed, now see where the king's spear is in the cruise of water that was at his bolter. I got it here. And Saul knew David's voice and said, Is this thy voice, my son David? <laughs> Isn't Saul funny? Is this David, my son's voice? And he's been caught again, hadn't he? And David said, it is my voice, O Lord, O King. David's still giving him all the honor that God wants him to have. And he said, Wherefore doth the Lord thus pursue after his servant? For what have I done? Or what evil is in my hand? What have I done to you, Saul? Don't you want to say that to your enemies sometimes? Now therefore I pray thee, let my Lord the King hear the words of the, his servant, 
if the Lord has stirred thee up against me, let him accept an offering. But if they be the children of men, curse be they before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. Now therefore let not my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord, for the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea. Is that what you come to seek, a flea? I'm just a flea. He says that several times throughout this book. As when one doth hunt a partridge in the mountains, then said Saul, I have sinned. Do you believe him? I don't believe him. Here's another lie in the Bible. Said by a man doing evil. Return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm. You've said that before, Saul, a dozen times. Because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. And David answered and said, Behold the king's spear. Let one of the young men come over and fetch it. And the Lord rendered to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered thee into my hand today. And I would not stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set by in the eyes of the Lord. Let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David. Don't believe this guy. David doesn't, David doesn't believe him. The next verse says so. Thou shalt both do great things and also shalt prevail, still prevail. So David went his way and Saul returned to his place. And look at verse 1 of chapter 27. Did David believe anything he was saying? Not a word. And David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. Why do you believe him? I don't believe Saul anything he says. You can't believe him. He lied all the time. He said all through here, I'm not going to kill David. I'm not going to kill David. Let's kill him. I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. David, had he trusted the Philistines more than he trusted Saul. And Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel, so I shall escape out of his hand. He's willing to spare the life of Saul. Are you willing to spare the life of your enemy that wants to destroy you? Or do you insist on gossiping about him and ripping him to shreds? Is that what you want? You realize how much this is about us? The orge is about us. God put it in us. God will conquer that in each one of us when he sees fit. And he'll conquer our enemies. If we can get it in our head, what Paul said in the 12th chapter of Romans, vengeance is mine. If there's any repaying to do, I will do it. You don't do it. Am I out of time? I'm out. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for truth. Teach us what we need to know about the orge, about ourselves. Thank you for truth. Fight our battles because we cannot. Teach us that we can't fight our battles. It takes a lot of fire and trials, Lord. I know that personally. That's what it takes not to fight. Lead us to your elect family. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> Saul was full of the orge, wasn't he? Couldn't believe nothing he said. Huh? Yeah, it's what? Yeah, you couldn't believe Jacob. <laughs> what are you doing? You want some gum? What, can I have that? Well, I don't need it, really. You want some gum? Come here. All right. Here you go. Hold on.
hold on. Can you hold on? Get out my big knife. Gut this open, okay? Come here. There you go. There you go. You want some gum? How you doing, Slim? <laughs> How you doing? Hey, what are you doing? Have you been guilty of any of this? A little bit. A little bit. Here you go. Jim, let me ask you a question. What? First Samuel chapter 10. When it's, the Lord says he's going to make Saul a new, a new man. And the Spirit of God comes on him. And he gives him a new heart. Is that like, is he being born again there? I don't know. We know where there was not a goodlier man in Israel like Saul in the ninth chapter. Is that a condemnation or a praise? No, that's a bragging on him. Yeah. He was a good man. Yeah. It's just that the position is it, is that he got as a coming from the tribe of Benjamin, God made him that way. Yeah. You know? When he receives his new heart there in chapter 10. It's almost the start of his problems, too. Yeah, it is, isn't it? What are you doing there? Hello. <laughs> Well, the thing is, that can be us when we're living in our contrariness. I don't even think most people know about this fight between Saul and David. It wasn't a fight. It was just a one-sided pursuit. Well, they don't, when they read it, they don't see that Saul's lying. He's lying they through his teeth. Yeah, they don't even know that. They just say, I'll not, I'll not kill David. And they just keep reading. Not paying attention to what's being said. This is a narrative of a soap opera that's what it is and until you see that you're not and you're not going to understand why you don't need to be involved in your gay that you got to get over it you can't hold things against people god made them that way and you want to hold it against the goat for being a goat you get mad at him i don't like it because you're a goat he goes you know, we go by this market over here and we see these goats we go over and argue with them Become a sheep. Accept me as your savior. It's crazy. Why do we get angry at the things that God has ordained? I've learned not to be angry at anybody that's left here and started trouble. If they come back, I say, you're not going to start trouble, are you? If you do, you don't need to come back. I've said that to two or three people, and they say, okay. It's just, to me, it's funny how God gives us these illustrations in the Old Testament. And you don't read it slow enough to know what's going on. You can't hear this all at once. No. Well, you've got to take the time and you've got to study who are all David's nephews. That's right. Sons. Yeah, and you've got to know that. Like that. Until you know who they are and who's talking. Yeah, and You're if, if you don't know that, Abish, that Joab was a killer. Right. The guy, and he chewed David out when they come back from that battle with, when he killed Absalom, he goes back to Jerusalem.